this video, we would be discussing about all the mathematics that is required to learn quantum mechanics. Now, if you have been following my series of videos on the mathematics of quantum mechanics, this is the final and the last video which will complete our discussion on complex numbers and we will take our journey further. So, the viewers who have not watched my series of videos, not a problem, don't worry, because in this video that you are watching now, I would be completing all the mathematics of quantum mechanics in a very easy, simple and a lucid manner and in a layman's language so that you do not face any problem in understanding the concepts and further doing your studies in quantum mechanics. My name is Shaunak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. A warm welcome to this series of videos Mathematics of Quantum Mechanics. So first we would be dealing with uh, the mathematics which we left last which is the Euler's number and then we will summarize all the essential mathematics that it required for learning quantum physics. So first let us see what are the topics that we are covering. We would be first talking about what is periodicity. This is one part which I left uh, unfinished in my last video on Euler's number. Then we will learn what is complex numbers in quantum mechanics. Why do we need at all complex numbers? Is it that complex numbers are required? What is the complex conjugate and why do we use complex con conjugates to solve wave equations? What is a complex spell Mandelbrot set and a little bit about the final touch on Euler's numbers and exponential form. So this is one complete video which is going to give you all the mathematical concepts and knowledge that you need to learn quantum physics. So first we will learn what is a periodicity. Now the word itself periodic means what? That it is a kind of a repetition. So periodic function is a function that repeats itself uh, its values at regular intervals. For example, the trigonometric functions which repeat at intervals of 2 pi radians are periodic functions. Now periodic functions are used throughout science and physics to describe oscillations, waves and other different phenomena and which exhibit a kind of a periodic nature. Any function that is not periodic is called aperiodic. Now this is a kind of a simple uh, you know illustration which shows that the example of periodic functions with period P and this graph is going on and on and on. So now the question is that we have understood that something which repeats itself and obviously it should be at regular intervals is what is called periodicity. Now can we define periodicity in a very generic way? So a function f is said to be periodic if for some non-zero constant capital P it is a case like this f uh, x plus p equals to f of x. Now note that for all values of x in the domain a non-zero constant capital P for which this is the case is called a period of that function. If there exists a, a least positive constant p with the property it is called fundamental period. Often the period of a function is used to mean its fundamental period which I have not covered in this video. Okay, now because we are willing to know the periodic functions on a complex number, let us first define and see what is periodic function on real numbers. Now, let us see an illustration. You see that it's a graph of a sine function which allows two complete periods. It starts with minus 2 pi and it ends at plus 2 pi. So, these two uh, blue lines I have mentioned in order to make you understand about these two periods that are being complete. Okay, so uh, what happens is that the sine function with a period uh, 2 pi since sine x plus 2 pi equals to sine of x for all values of x. So what happens is that the function repeats on intervals of length of 2 pi which I have just shown you. Now for everyday example, uh, periodicity is seen for example the hands of a clock, this is periodic which keeps on happening, the phases of moon, it shows periodic behavior. So, periodic motion is a motion in which the position of the system are expressible as periodic functions. Now, for a function on the real numbers or an integer, that means that the entire graph can be formed from copies of one particular portion repeated at regular intervals. So, one graph which repeats again and again and again. So, this is called periodicity. Okay, now we come to the most important part that periodic function with complex numbers and I would like to refer 
to the famous Euler's formula which we have seen in the last video. In case you have missed, I have given it in the last video and in the i button also you can go to the playlist and find it out. Now referring to this Euler's formula, what we can say that the periodic uh, e uh, raised to the power i theta is a periodic function of theta with a period of 3, 2 pi. What does that mean? It means this. Now from here, <laughs> you can just take a note, from here calculating the complex conjugate uh, becomes a little bit easier if you do a little bit of trigonometry. So you see we take the complex conjugate of ei uh, theta equal to cos theta plus i sin theta which leads to further this and we find out this. So I am not going to explain this because this is very simple. So I just thought that uh, why don't I demonstrate what is the complex conjugate. Uh, in the polar form and how it happens. So what we can deduce from here that if you are given a complex number like this, we can find out this one which follows equals to this one and which follows equals to this one. <coughs> Simple, right? So what we can uh, in, uh, uh, you know infer from here is that even if the exponent uh, that is e is complex, all the basic properties of the exponential function is being are being conserved. Now what do I mean by exponential function? You need to go back to my last video where there are certain properties of the exponential functions and that obeys I have discussed at length over there. The exponential notation is part particularly well suited for multiplying, dividing and inverting complex numbers. Okay, so right at this point of our video we have completed all we uh, wanted to tell you about periodicity complex numbers, periodicity and how it is helps in Euler number. Now we are going to look into, okay, so let us these few examples, if z equals to this and w equals to this, so z multiplied by w, it leads to this and it leads to this, that's it. And finally we get this. So it is a kind of a just a, you know, pure calculation, pure mathematics, nothing much into it. If you really want to look further, then you can look into this. Or you can look into this. I'm not going to explain. These are taken from certain books. These are plain exercises. So if you want, you can take a pause of this video right now and take a note of that if you're really keen to find out how the calculations work. Okay, so what I was telling that now that we have completed periodicity, Euler's number, now is this time that we go back and summarize what we have learned in those three, four lessons. And those who have missed, I would request pay attention here because I would be completing, I would be explaining the most important part of the video of quantum mechanics, the mathematics part. And the first part starts with complex numbers and why do we need complex numbers in quantum mechanics. Okay, so the solution to any quadratic equation of the form x squared plus bx plus c equals to zero is obviously x equals to minus b plus minus square root of b square minus 4ac upon 2a. And this is elementary. So if you try now, if we take a kind of an equation like this, x squared plus 5x plus 10 equals to 0. <coughs> so what we get is this. While further calculating, we get the internal of the root that is 25 minus 4 into 10 leads to uh, square root of minus 15. Now this is the point of worry and is there a real number whose square leads to this number? And this is where complex numbers come in. So this is the first example just to demonstrate to you that how complex numbers come and what are the problems that the mathematician faced during that time. And this is a kind of a typical example. Now complex numbers are used in many applications in physics, chemistry, biology, electrical engineering, statistics and even finance and economics. And I can tell you that complex numbers are now being used in data science also. So this first example actually shows you the point where we encounter complex numbers. So given this kind of a formula, this is actually not real, while this is not real. So the definition of imaginary unit number is we define imaginary unit number i as the square root of minus 1, that is i equals to square root of minus 1. Now if we take the further values and substitute here, we get this, which is approximately equals to 3.87i. So this is just to let you know the definition and if we're substituting the value, how complex number leads into. Now, if I take a kind of a, <coughs> you know, uh, I would say this is a probability density. Those who are aware about quantum physics, you know. 
and we are trying to find the value that is the possible outcomes of the measurement where a particular electron is then we get something which is called a schrodinger equation and the value of i comes here which is actually the behavior of a per, uh, particle or a group of particle is encapsulated in this wave like entity so just to tell you that you can see that when we are trying to make the outcome of a particular electron where the electron could be only what we get is a possibility of that and that possibility when we are measuring through a time dependent or a time independent schrodinger equation we encounter the imaginary number so even the great physicist Erwin Schrodinger was perplexed by the occurrence of complex numbers in quantum mechanics and he writes to his friend Hendrik Anton Lorentz that complex numbers have been found to be an inherent quantum mechanics and hence quantum, quantum computing so he finds it's unpleasant and he writes what is unpleasant here and indeed directly to be objective is the use of complex numbers which is denoted by the greek letter psi is surely fundamentally a real function <coughs> so this is uh, you know how it happens okay so uh, for uh, let us take an example that how we are trying to interpret for a classical electromagnetic wave now these are all being discussed in my last video right so i am just trying to summarize in case you want a further detailed study go to my playlist in quantum physics where you can find these details okay so we take a classical electromagnetic wave that means we are not taking the relativistic wave equation and we are traveling a particle traveling along the z axis and we write it by the uh, normal wave equation and now when we break the equation into positive and negative frequency we find this one and we find this one so what i am trying to make a point is that positive and negative frequency parts have to be present in equal measure and a wave function for a single material particle must have only a positive frequency part so it it would be somewhere equals to this one i omega t plus i k z so for a negative z direction if it is going in negative z direction it has to be here so what i am trying to make a important point over here is that in classical physics since everything is ultimately real i mean to say there are no imaginary numbers right all real number positive and negative frequency parts have to be present in equal nature or in equal measure that means there has to be something which would compensate the positive and the negative part so here you see this is something we find this minus i value so it would allow for a wave like phenomena and at the same time only allow positive frequencies as required by positive energy or p particles complex function hence enter quantum mechanics so you can go back to this and you can find out why we are using this minus i why it comes in because we have to find a single material particle but the positive frequency is there so this shows the importance and the real need why we are encountering complex numbers in quantum mechanics and how it happens now we all do mathematics of quantum mechanics and we are expert in doing complex conjugates but have we ever wondered uh that why do we need complex conjugate in quantum mechanics at all so here is a kind of a, a you know a illustration so you see here is a, a person who is standing and he is telling that no i am more comfortable with real numbers so complex function which uh, has i equals to square root of minus 1 <coughs> in quantum mechanics wave functions determine the behavior of the physical system and which are usually complex functions so the probability of the particle you see px comma x and this is where we are doing the complex conjugate because the complex conjugate of a function is obtaining by replacing every occurrence of square root of minus 1 in that function of minus i the question is that why are we trying to find out the complex conjugate here is the answer so it eliminates the complex numbers and it produces a real number and because in the real world we are all very comfortable so we deal with that right so here is an example if a equals to 3 plus 4i then can we find out the complex conjugate so you see it yields to a value which is 25 and the value is real so it helps us really to help in conjugation and that is why we do the complex conjugate of wave equations so that it produces word value 
Further, you can say that the wave function represents the probability amplitude for a given particle at a given point in space and given time. And the actual probability of finding the particle is the psi of x, y, z. I have taken it four dimension with time is equal to the probability amplitude. And when we normalize it by taking the integral and the complex conjugate, we get a value that is 1. So, here is the need. So, first we understood why and how we are encountering complex number. Then we saw why complex numbers are coming because of the Schrodinger equation and the real need for complex number arises from here. And now we see that why do we need complex conjugate to conjugate it so that we get an easy way out and do the mathematics better and we we'll find out the possibility of the position of the electron. Now, all these are taken fine and good. But ultimately, these all the quantum mechanics and the uh, Schrodinger wave equation or other equations are happening in a complex plane. So, let us quickly understand that what actually is a complex plane. <laughs> now, here is a kind of a straight line, right? You see the positive going on the blue right direction and the negative going in the uh, left direction. So, here is the real number and here is the real number. Now, where do we put this number 3 plus 4i? In case it's a wave equation or anything that comes up. Where do we really put it? So, imaginary number goes up and down. So, if we take a quadrant like this, so we have to go right direction 3 because the 3 is the real part and we go 4 steps upwards, that is 4i, and we try to locate the number something over here. So, 3 units up and 4 units up. Four in, four in, 3 units along the x axis, right direction, and 4 units up the imaginary axis. Why this is again we are learning because in quantum physics the type of equations that we will get we can only imagine and we can get it on a complex plane. So here again if you say something as 4 minus 2i then we have to go 4 steps towards the right because that is a real number and negative quadrant up to 2 steps minus 2i and somehow we can uh, you know get the point like this 4 units along the real axis 2 units down. So, we can say that a complex plane or the comp is complex because it's a combination of real and imaginary. Why it is a plane? Because obviously it is a geometric representation through Cartesian coordinates. Now, this complex plane and this complex number, I just started one video series which I have just posted today, which is called the History of Complex Analysis. If you're really, really interested to know, what is the imagine number, who discovered it, how the complex analysis came into flow, who discovered the imaginary number, all these are into my video, uh, which is there, just I have posted today, which is called the uh, history of complex analysis and you can look into it. Now, another important part, apart from quantum mechanics, which is, which are called fractals. Now, this leads to some wonderful depiction of the way nature is and it is called the Mandelbrot set. Now, this is the set which was first defined and drawn by Robert W. Brooks and Peter Matelski in 1978 as a part of study of Kleinian groups. And afterwards, in 1980, Benoit Mandelbrot obtained a high-quality visualization of the set while working at IBM's Thomas J. Watson Research Center in New York Heights, uh, Yorktown Heights at New York. So, it is basically putting this complex value, iterating this again and again. And now you see that this is basically a kind of a zooming. We have zoomed it and you will find. So, not only it is the case that we encounter complex numbers only with quantum mechanics, even with fractals and further dynamic designs, we find this in, in further equations. We have also get a wonderful trivia or a fact which I am sure you are going to enjoy. That complex numbers we have seen are essentially extension of real numbers. So, we see the real plane and then we extend it further to real numbers. Question is that, is there any extension to complex numbers? Yes. So, it is called, so from real to complex, complex to another, which is called quaternion. And it is denoted by this capital bold H. So, this quaternion has a feature that they are not commutative. That is, AB would not be equals to BA. And quaternions are points in a four-dimensional hyperspace. So, we're dealing with hyperspace, you will come across quaternion. The next obvious question, which is uh, keeping you busy in your mind, is that is there an extension of quaternion? And the answer is yes. And they are called octonions, which is denoted by the bold O. And the octonions have a feature something like this. 
and something like this. So octonions can be seen as a point in an eight dimensional hyperspace. So now we come to the final part, uh, which is Euler's number and exponential form. We have already dealt with this, so I will just touch base. Uh, we have seen z equals to a plus bi, and uh, this is not always suited for multiplying and dividing. So we get a kind of a com uh, Euler's number where e is the base of the natural logarithm, x is the real, and i is imaginary. So the importance that we need to understand is that Euler's number establishes the fundamental relationship between trigonometric functions and exponential functions. You can think that is a way of bridging two representation of the same unit complex in the complex plane. Okay, so Euler's number has a value, something a weird value like this. And from here we can find that E is an irrational number. It is a base of natural logarithms invented by the famous John Napier and is found in many interesting areas. And if you really want to get this value, e equals 2.718281 dot dot dot. Then there is a plot which I have not mentioned. You can further calculate this. And however, this has got some interesting properties. What are those properties? In order to know, you have to go back to my uh, last video on Euler's number where I have discussed it. Okay, so that completes our entire journey of complex numbers and the journey of complex numbers, what we need to know about quantum mechanics. And from the next time onwards, I would be starting with the linear algebra for quantum mechanics. That means uh, the amount of linear algebra which is required to do quantum mechanics. So the, the complex number part is complete. If you want to know more about complex numbers, I'm coming up with a new series of videos which is called Complex Analysis, which deals with the real hardcore mathematics of complex numbers. I've already started one video, which is the first lesson, which is the history of complex analysis, and it will be followed. But here, we take a pause, and from the next video, I would be showing, demonstrating, explaining you about the linear algebra right from the very beginning and how and what are the important parts of linear algebra which helps us in a better learning of quantum mechanics. So this is uh, all about today's video. This is Seanock signing off from Physics for Students. Please do subscribe, like and comment about this particular series, how it is going on. Do not forget to click on the bell icon and click on the all notification so that you can get all the notification from Physics for Students. I will be back with this linear algebra in this series of video for quantum mechanics. Till then, goodbye and wish you a very happy weekend ahead. Bye. Thank you for watching this video. We appreciate your time and patience. If you want to connect with us and provide further feedback, comment or suggestions, please email us at contact.physicsforstudents at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. See you soon in the next video.